one of the ironies of modern Buddhism is that the Buddha is represented as teaching us that we should have a non-reactive state of mind, a non-judging state of mind as our approach to life in general. Whereas when you look at his teachings, there are a lot of judgments from the very beginning. As he said, there are two paths that should be avoided, the path of sensual indulgence and the path of self-torture. He recommends instead the middle way, the Noble Eightfold Path. That's a value judgment right there. And toward the end of his life, he was asked if there were awakened beings and other teachings. And he said, any teaching that has the Noble Eightfold Path can give rise to awakened beings. If there's a lack of the Noble Eightfold Path, there are no, no awakened beings at all. So again, a value judgment. And there are basically two things you judge. One is who can be a good teacher to you, and secondly, you judge your own actions. For a teacher, he says, you look for someone who's knowledgeable, compassionate, and truthful. Someone who really knows how to put an end to suffering and will tell you truthfully how to do it. And they have compassion for you. They won't try to get you to do anything that would be for your harm. Now to judge that, you have to stay with that person for quite a while, get a sense of that person. But the issue of your own happiness and suffering is important enough that you should be willing to spend time. You can't decide on the basis of a little thumbnail sketch or a picture in, on a website. You have to be around that person. But notice, the important quality of that person is that he or she be compassionate. And that's the attitude you have to have to yourself as well, when you judge yourself. As you're judging yourself, you're not trying to come to a final conclusion, a final judgment on your worth as a person. It's more judging what you're doing and how effective it is in putting an end to suffering. And the purpose of that judgment is so that you can change your behavior if it's not up to standard, so that you do put an end to suffering. You're judging your out of compassion. And wise people who judge you will judge you out of compassion as well. But a lot of us coming to the practice have very immature attitudes towards being judged. We're judging ourselves or have very bad patterns of standards of judging, which is one of the reasons why the Buddha starts out by saying, make your mind like earth. This is his first meditation instruction to his son. People throw disgusting things on the earth, but the earth doesn't react. So the same way negative things come up in your meditation, as you watch your mind. Try to be solid. Try to be non-reactive. So you can admit that, yes, these things are there. Because if you're going to see your own unskillful habits and do something about them, first you have to admit they're there and not get blown away by them. Now, this is based on some of the Buddha's earlier teachings to his son about learning how to judge mistakes. He said, if you see you've done something that caused harm either to yourself or to others, you go talk it over with someone else. In other words, don't be ashamed to admit it. You talk it over with that other person to get some ideas about how not to repeat that mistake. Then he says you should feel shame over that mistake. That's a word that's loaded here in English. But it's good to remember there are two types of shame. There's the shame that's the opposite of pride, which is not what the Buddha is recommending here. After all, he does have you have a sense of confidence that, yes, you can do this path. It's not beyond your capabilities. That's the path that's open to you. The Buddha never asked people before he taught them the end of suffering, do you deserve to suffer or not? Some people seem to think that they deserve to suffer, but that was never a question. If you're suffering, here's the way out. Because after all, we've all done things in the past that are pretty unskillful. And if you have to be perfectly pure before you can find an end of suffering, or begin the path to end of suffering, you'd never get on the path. The path is for people who are not pure. The path is for people who are not wise. It's there to make you pure, make you wise. 
as you act on it, reflect on it, reflect on the results of what you're doing, and trying to do them more and more skillfully with less and less harm. The shame that Buddha's recommending there is the opposite of shamelessness. In other words, the attitude where you don't care what other people think. You don't care what wise people think. You just want to do what you want to do. That, the kind of shame that's the opposite of shamelessness, is healthy. You do care what wise people think. You want to live up to their standards. That's a way of developing self-esteem. So already he's given Rahula, his son, some training in self-esteem. So as he sees unskillful things happening in his mind, he's not blown away. And then the Buddha gives him tools to work with those things. You don't just watch things coming and going, because you're not just on the receiving end of things. A lot of mindfulness instructions seem to assume that you're just there on the receiving end of good or bad things, and learning how not to get upset by the bad things, not getting overly excited by the good things as if you were just a consumer of experiences. But you're also a producer. You're making choices. You're acting. And you want to act on skillful choices, act on skillful mental states. Some of the modern clinical definitions of mindfulness, on the one hand, tell you to be non-judging of whatever comes up in your mind. But then they tell you to try to be skillful in your actions, thoughtful in the way you act. We're going to be skillful in your actions only if you can develop skillful mind states. So you have to learn how to judge your mind states so that they do lead to skillful actions. The Buddha himself said he got on the path by dividing his thinking into two sorts, thoughts that were inspired by sensuality, ill will, harmfulness. Those he said you had to keep in check. The thoughts that were inspired by renunciation, in other words, trying to find happiness in a way that doesn't involve sensuality, i.e., what we're doing right now, trying to find a sense of well-being as you focus on the breath. Thoughts based on non ill will and harmlessness, those he said you can encourage. And you do that by being mindful. Remember, his meaning of mindfulness was not a non-reactive state. It was the ability to keep something in mind. In this case, you're keeping in mind the duties that the Buddha set out in the Four Noble Truths, like we chanted just now. Suffering is to be comprehended. Its cause is to be abandoned. The cessation is to be realized, and you do that by developing the path. That's a way of dividing up your experience so you know what to do with it for the sake of your happiness. Here again, the Buddha is not imposing the duties on you. He's simply observing that if you want to find true happiness, this is what you've got to do. So in that context, he says, mindfulness as a governing principle means that you notice that there are skillful qualities that have not arisen in the mind yet, then you try to give rise to them. When they are there, you try to make sure they don't pass away. Here again, you're not just watching things coming and going. You're trying to bring skillful mind states into being, prevent their going away. Another place he says, one of the duties of right mindfulness is to Remember to develop skillful qualities and abandon unskillful ones. So that's the complete practice of mindfulness. When you practice it that way, then the mind settles down. You're focused on the body in and of itself. You're ardent, alert, mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reverence to the world. That's the standard formula. So you stay with the body right here, right now. And just take one aspect of it that you experience, like the breath. Then you stay alert to what the breath is doing and how you are staying with the breath. And then you're ardent in trying to do this well. Put your whole heart into it, because this is the path to the end of suffering. And the Buddha has you take that as an important task. The world imposes all kinds of other tasks on you, the work you have to do. People demanding that you side with them on some political issue, and that you're the enemy if you don't side with them, as if the whole world were divided over that particular issue. You have to realize that you have your issues. You have greed, aversion, and delusion. They're causing harm to you. They're causing harm to others. 
Those are your responsibilities. So you focus on your responsibilities. Remember one of the Buddhist definitions that the difference between a fool and a wise person. A fool takes up duties that don't fall to him or her. A wise person takes up duties that do fall to him or her. In this case, if you want to put an end to suffering, these are your duties. They're for your own benefit. And as you follow through with them, you benefit others around you. Because as I said, your mind is not just on the receiving end. You're not just a spectator in the world. You're an actor. So you want to make sure that your actions come out of a good place in your mind. Because you're responsible for what comes out in your thoughts and your words and your deeds. That's where your real responsibility lies. So focus there. As the Buddha said, you can find happiness this way. You're not just being a good citizen. You're being a happy person, a person that can find well-being inside, because you've got resources inside that you can develop. And John Lee makes this comment that we have so many resources inside us that get undeveloped, stay undeveloped. One, because we don't appreciate them, we don't know where the potentials are. And two, we're distracted by other things that really don't fall to us as our responsibilities. So look inside for your potentials. You have mindfulness already to some extent, alertness. You are ardent about some things. We want to develop these qualities in the right direction. Most importantly, you want to be ardent about putting an end to suffering. Because when you're ardent in that way, that makes your mindfulness right, your alertness right. Because otherwise you can be mindful of anything. You can be alert to anything. And it would still count as mindfulness or alertness. But for it to be right, you have to be ardent in trying to do this well, for the sake of your happiness. So you are making judgments all along about what's skillful, what's not. But you're doing it in such a way that you realize that it is for your own benefit. So learn how to exercise your judgment well. Be mature in how you judge things and how you judge your actions. Just as you look for a teacher who's knowledgeable, truthful, and compassionate, you have to learn how to be knowledgeable, truthful, and compassionate as well. But these are potentials we all have within us, and they're really good to develop.